serial number Whiskey Delta 935, a light bomber. Five Tango 134, Whit, how do you read? Five Tango 134, Roger, you're loud and clear. Canberra, lot number eight. 1,500 pounds, I'm here. Yeah. Whitney's in runway 09, surface wind 110, 14 knots, visibility 20 kilometres in rain. One octa at 1,500, eight octa at 6,000. 6,200, 6,500, 6,800, 7,000. Okay, Sammy. All right, I can hear you. Okay. All right. Well, the checks are on the other side. Generator water lights are. The Canberra sells then for £7,200 on the left of the room. Any advance, £7,200. So. After 38 years, Whiskey Delta 935 and its ghosts leave the service of the Royal Air Force for the aviation graveyard. But the rest of this British branch of the Canberra family is still alive and well, living in Witten in an often wet and always windy corner of Cambridgeshire. Forty years after it first flew, the Canberra remains in active service and the RAF has decided to celebrate by giving its oldest jet a birthday party. As long as we look after the aeroplanes and husband them well, which of course we do, uh, they can go on for an awfully long time. As you well know, we're celebrating the 40th anniversary of the first flight this year. And if you wanted to indulge in some really long-term planning, I would suggest you put an entry in your diary for 1999, because I think we'll be celebrating the 50th. Good morning. The aircraft is old and therefore it presents demands, particularly for the crews, which might not be present in more modern aircraft. For example, it's subject to vagaries of the weather that might be ignored in other more modern types. But no, it doesn't give us any, any major problems and we're very fond of it. It makes demands on crews and uh, in particular it has something of a reputation for being tricky to fly on one engine. It's not in any sense unsafe as long as you abide by the rules. It's uh, a physically demanding aeroplane to fly as well, which is unusual these days. For the most part, the cameras do not have power control. And after a couple of hours um, flying the aircraft, one feels physically tired. That's unusual. It's, uh, yes, it is demanding and therefore, as always, satisfying. Five Tango 134, Whitney, how do you read? Five Tango 134, Roger, you're loud and clear. Whitney using runway 09, colour code blue. There are still 70 cameras flying with the RAF, even though the idea that became the aeroplane first took to the drawing board in 1944. The highest flying are photo reconnaissance aircraft. As well as their RAF duties, these are used nowadays for survey and mapping work. Aircraft from Witten helped to locate bodies and wreckage at Lockerbie in December 1988. They often help the police too. One Hundred Squadron is one of the largest in the RAF. In what sounds a risky business, its aircraft provide target facilities for all three services. Paradoxically, they teach soldiers, sailors and other airmen how best to shoot aeroplanes down. Sometimes the aircraft themselves are used as targets to be hunted. The Canberra can be surprisingly agile. No one would call these cameras, flown by the crews of 360 Squadron, lovely aeroplanes. Their warts, bumps and bulges hide complex electronic equipment designed to mimic the atmosphere of modern war. The badge of 360 Squadron says, Confusamus, we confuse, they do. It's the spring of 1989 and there's a shocking blue camera at Witten. It's been prepared for Roland Beaumont, the original test pilot. Forty years on, he's back to reenact his first flight. He came to roll out 
the, the, this was not an occasion. This was some um, uh, two, uh, two or three months of hard work had been going in final assembly on this aeroplane. Uh, the moment of opening the hangar doors and getting it out into the open to run the engines was the next stage in the program. And so when it happened, the foreman in charge said, OK, open the doors. And a tractor driver hooked up the front and drove, drove it out onto the airfield. And there were half a dozen chaps who were working on the job with it. Um, well, you, you've seen what goes on today. I mean, you have um, 12 five-star generals, all the flags of all the nations, military bands, junket, and, uh, and, and laser beams in all directions. Um, very, very considerable tr contrast. And on the first flight, uh, we went straight off and retracted the undercarriage as soon as we became airborne, unlike uh, modern practice where mo modern first flights seem to take place with the undercarriage fixed down and go on for, for many flights afterwards until people are uh, confident enough to retract it. But, so we retracted the undercarriage as soon as we became airborne and um, climbed to about 10,000 feet. And um, we knew from that flight, from that moment onwards, that this aeroplane was going to be a world beater. I don't think anybody, any of us thought that it was going to still be in service 40 years later, but um, it was a good aeroplane, right from the start. The Farnborough air displays of the early 1950s made the Canberra a source of real national pride. The pilots who flew there became household names. Peg, Britannia. Trubshaw, the Viscount. Bryce, Vickers Valiant. Tyson, Princess Flying Boat. Beaumont, Canberra Trainer. Beaumont, a former fighter pilot, was one of the most famous and fastest of the test flyers. He was already the first Briton to have flown faster than the speed of sound. Starting again with trainers, highly important in the education of air crews in this jet age, the Canberra trainer is now seen to advantage in a spectacular sequence which shows off her amazing manoeuvrability. The RAF had ordered Canberras in large numbers and Beaumont delivered the first one in 1951. When we delivered this first aeroplane, um, uh, I've been in touch with the station commander, who was uh, Group Captain Sheen, Wally Sheen, a very, a very um, a brilliant character. And he said, well, when you, when you bring this thing over, um, do, uh, put on a show when you get here, you see. So I said, yes, all right, I will. And I arrived over the Binbrook circuit and then put this camber into the sort of aerobatic demonstration which we got well, well practiced by then. Uh, a couple of days uh, after that, I went back to my base, of course, at Wharton, and uh, a formal letter came in from Strike Command, uh, couched in very stern terms, saying that the delivery of the uh, Royal Air Force's first camera to Binbrook had been carried out in circumstances of uh, considerable indecorum. And uh, what was behind all this was, of course, that the, the Air Force were a bit slow to, to recognize what was happening to them. But they were going from these great, big, heavy, cumbersome, rather slow Lincolns to the very agile, fighter-like uh, Canberra. The Canberra was a record breaker and began a long series of attention-getting trips. Some went out across the ocean and others more or less straight up to record heights. How did it feel up there, 12 miles high? Well, the sky is very blue above you, and mm. there's uh, a lot of the glare from the atmosphere is below you instead of above you, mm. and uh, you could see a long way. That's how, about all. How far could you see? Uh, well, on the day in question, there was a lot of cloud towards the east of England, mm. uh, but over Devon, Cornwall, and uh, west of Wales, and the east coast of Ireland, you could see all that, just like a small atlas, long way below 12 miles below. <laughs> Grove RAF station, Northern Ireland. A Canberra, on delivery to an American factory, lands for filling and checking before having a crack at the record. The aircraft is piloted by Wing Commander Beaumont. She'll need her full load of paraffin, not petrol. Built by English Electric and powered by two Rolls-Royce Avon jets, she'll make the 2,073 miles crossing in one hop. Royal Aero Society officials seal the engines and will time the flight from the takeoff. A certificate of sealing with a copy of the seal must be presented at Gander, Newfoundland. The record attempt is Wing Commander Beaumont's first crossing as pilot. 
Mr. Rylands will radio progress reports, and it's up to Mr. Watson to keep her on course. Now Beaumont is ready. The Batman gives the last signal, and the Canberra's off to report four hours and 19 minutes later, a new record for Britain. On the way out, we'd found a jet stream, you know, one of these high-level, high um, very, very powerful winds bucking us, which delayed our flight out a bit. But we knew where it was, and so we got back into the middle of it, which is about 42,000 feet on the way back, and we uh, sat in this jet stream all the way over, cruising the Canberra at its optimum cruising speed. Uh, and we did the leg from Gander to Aldergrove in three hours and I think 14 minutes, which, um, which was quick by any standards. The Canberra became the mainstay of Bomber Command, an aviation link between the Lancasters and Mosquitoes of World War II and the new high-tech age of the nuclear V-bombers. In the early 50s, the dangers of the Canberra became apparent. Crews used to the feel of less agile aircraft sometimes became confused and there were crashes. The Canberra played its full part too in the ceremonial of the RAF. In 1953, one flew the first pictures of the coronation to the United States. But its brief British fighting career began and ended in one year, in 1956, the year of Suez. Egypt's Prime Minister, Colonel Nasser, had nationalised the Suez Canal. Israel, France and Britain, each for different reasons but acting in collusion, decided to go to war, destroy the Egyptian forces, topple Nasser and regain control. Israel was to mount an attack on Egypt. Britain and France, while pretending to separate the warring parties, were to retake the canal. Bombing was to be used. Suez then became really the only true operational use by the RAF of the Canberra in any front-line service uh, as part of the overall air plan for Operation Musketeer. And the intention of the Canberra's, along with their valiant counterparts from Bomber Command, was to deny the use of the Egyptian Air Force. So they were employed in a strategic role to destroy the Egyptian Air Force in their primary role, but then also, and in fact what they'd ended up doing as many of their sorties on, was to attack strategic targets such as tank parks and barracks, and then also in support of various other raids as well. Suez brought the end of the main force of Bomber Command, and as soon as Suez was over and the squadrons were back by the end of 1956, then the, con the rundown of the Canberra squadrons continued. Uh, and so by the early 1960s, it had gone. Bomber Command had lost its bomber element of Canberra's. The Canberra's performed to effect in other wars. The Americans used their own version in Vietnam, and the Royal Australian Air Force flew it there as well. And in one of the savage ironies of war, its last and very effective use as a bomber was against British ground forces during the Falklands War of 1982. But it's the RAF who intend to give their Canberra's a 40th birthday party with cakes and, it must be said, a certain amount of ale. Thousands of the airmen who flew the Canberra are expected to turn up at Witten. The aeroplanes have been polished and preened, uniforms pressed, belts blancoed and brasses buffed. In the spirit of the occasion, there's even a military joke. One of the fighter pilots' most deadly missiles is a sidewinder. The aero modelers provided the biggest range of cameras on show, but the RAF has 40 of the real thing on display for the world's press. They've turned up in somewhat larger numbers than might have been expected perhaps a reflection on one of the few interests shared by the military and the media, anniversaries. It's a particular pleasure for me to welcome you here this morning. I'm Group Captain Reg McKenrick. I have the considerable privilege of commanding Royal Air Force Witten. But I suspect, for a lot of us, the nostalgic highlight of the weekend, and indeed it is the thing which will start the whole thing off, will be a reenactment of the first flight of the Canberra back in 1949. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to see you, Red McKenrick. Good How do you do? Hello. But first, there's going to be a dinner party, or more formally, a guest night. Okay. So, Dermot, welcome to RF Whitman. It's a great pleasure to see you. Marshal of the Royal Air Force, Sir Dermot Boyle, saw the aeroplane into service as Chief of the Air Staff. He's one of the principal guests. And, of course, Roland Beaumont is another. 
There's enough gold braid on show to start a very upmarket hoopla store. Sir Patrick Hine is commander in chief of Strike Command, and no decent RAF guest night is complete without a piper. He was CNC Strike, and he provided over that one. He's an old buddy of mine, we threw hurricanes together in 1940. In the ante rooms, the craft, the aircraft, is in session. A lodge of shared experience. All ready for Sunday? You don't sound sure. Well, I put everything out. The Piper, too, is an airman, though of a rather different sort. For Reg McKendrick and his station, the rehearsals are over. It's the start of 24 hours of intense effort on the ground as well as in the air. A guest night in the RAF follows a set routine. It's a hangover, so to speak, from an earlier and more formal military age. Part ballet, part opera and all theatre. The 200 or so guests await the arrival of the top table. The top table, appropriately perhaps, invokes the blessing of the Almighty. And from the Padre tonight, a special prayer is required. Padre, the grace. God bless us gathered here tonight, celebrating 40 years of flight. For food and wine extremely pleasant, friends and comrades, past and present. Amen. Amen. Dinner, a very private occasion, is followed by the loyal toast. Mr. Vice, the Queen. Gentlemen, the Queen. And the loyal toast by speeches of congratulation and a certain amount of self-deprecation. For Roland Beaumont, it's a time to look back to the very early days. Um, since this is a Canberra occasion, I think you'll wish me to say something about it. Uh, and perhaps the first should be to repeat what I said to our general manager, Arthur Sheffield, uh, after the first two or three flights way back in 1949. He asked me to give it to him straight and say what I really thought of it. And I said, it's an old man's aeroplane. And I believe I'm going to find out about that tomorrow. <laughs> on the, on the, on the door, you know. Oh, yes. So we've got to make sure that when people are taking pictures, they don't actually uh, take anything of that number as well, otherwise it's going to confuse the jury. Squadron leader Dave Watson is Witten's Mr. Canberra. He's been flying them for 35 years. Well, you've got plenty of light today. Lovely, isn't it? Yeah. Today, in his late 50s, he's joined Beaumont and flying officer Michael Baker, Whitten's youngest navigator, to recreate the first flight. Uh, uh, yes, it was a uh, high gloss, and it was uh, it, it, it was that sort of uh, um, brilliance, but it had a, a bit of green in it. It was a greeny blue, mm. a, high, a very high gloss for the chief designer. Um, Teddy Petter, who decided to have it painted that colour, um, was so pleased with it, he, he got the, um, the, the paint sprayers or the paint shop to do his car out of the same can. <laughs> and he went and had a bright blue car and a bright blue aeroplane. First of all, we'll just go and have a look around, uh, have a look at the aeroplane, just to yeah. remind ourselves. This is one of the things I always remember getting out, because I always creased myself there. I've still got scars to show it. I know, they're <laughs> awful, these doors. They really catch you, anyway. Yeah. We're going to check in to make sure that it's uh, all safe before we have a look around. Yeah. It looks OK. You remember this very well, don't you, of course? Yeah, I always, <laughs> yes. Uh, it hasn't really changed, I don't think, very the, much, has it? The T4 was my favourite camera, but it, it'll do. <laughs> But things haven't changed very much at all. No, they haven't. That's they? right. These, these, those old avens have lasted well. They certainly have. Haven't they really? Well, I mean, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's quite incredible. I mean, it's one of the original axial flows, and it's really just kept going, isn't it? No, it's still a, a three cartridge uh, no, freak, this is, is it? No, this is the, this is this the original, original one. This is the original one. Aven one. That's, of course, I can see it. That's right, just yeah. got one cartridge yeah. there. Yeah. OK. We now... Uh, right. Oh, we've got to get ready to get in, I suppose. Okay. Right. Well, of course, the Canberra was the first aeroplane uh, in, in Royal Air Force service with an ejection seat. 
The media Absolutely. didn't have it. No, that's, and that's, the that's right. And the camera introduced yeah. ejection seats to, to the service. That's right, yeah. <laughs> well, of course, these are um, ground level, yeah. 90 knot seats. Yeah. So, um, you know, it really means, makes all the difference. So if you do have a the phrase, the boys in blue, was never more appropriate as Canberra P for Papa gets airborne with Roland Beaumont at the controls. Group captain Reg McKendrick's private air show has begun. The Canberra still looks well enough, even if age means that its former sprightly turns are off the display menu nowadays. the boys in blue are saluted by the boys in red, white and blue. Airplane 40 years ago and lovely airplane today. Feel the same? Oh, absolutely, yes. No, well, I think uh, I think I was. Let's wait for the noise stops. I think on the first flight I was absolutely amazed with with, with the uh, um, the quality of the controls. It was such a smooth, beautiful airplane to fly, and I know what it's like, so I'm not amazed anymore. But uh, just the same. On the ground, it's the nostalgia of old comrades. In the air, the red arrows provide spectacle, speed and colour. After some half-hearted descent from the air crews, it's been decided to call RAF Witten's formation team the Green Marrows. Time, perhaps, to be reminded that the Canberra is, in fact, no slouch. Well, in fact, Monty and I got uh, two international records. The most major, of course, would be the one from London to New Zealand, which we did. Uh, the only aircraft, I think, ever to have flown to New Zealand in less than 24 hours. I've tried it, it is, yeah. I think the most significant thing about our record is not uh, connected directly with the UK, but with New Zealand. And we brought oh, New yes. Zealand so much closer to the, what they call the old country. Witten's cameras have been around for a very long time, long enough for father and son to have flown in the same aeroplane. Today, squadron leader Smurden goes back to ground school, this time with a new but familiar instructor, his son. Use the radar calibration, a bit of fire extinguish and just the hydraulic pipes. And of course the undercarriage, check that someone has a lock, left the locks in. Have a look around the tyres. It's all the standard things you still check when you're flying today. Well, this has got the three-tier cartridge starting system, unlike the uh, one that you flew, which just had the single starter. Yeah, yeah. that you had to change every time. As you can see, they're getting the old man. The panels don't fit quite like they used to, but uh, still all right. Seen some wear. Well, it's uh, 27 years since I flew them, so... That made me one when you first flew. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be bad. Keeping them going. Marvellous turnout. The turnout includes aeroplanes from all the squadrons who flew the Canberra. And there's a visit from another retired bomber, which the Canberra saw into service and saw out too. Champagne, special glasses marked XL for 40, special programs, special food. Paid for not by the taxpayer, but by the Canberra crews who've come back to pay tribute to this, their special aeroplane. Thank you very much indeed for coming to join us. I know it would have taken a hell of a lot to have kept you away, but thank you very, very much indeed for coming 
in such numbers to make the day as successful as it has clearly been. Let me say on your behalf, thank you to Reg McKendrick and the splendid people here at Whitton for bringing it all off and marking this tremendous anniversary. If we may, we'd like to uh, unveil a painting of the Canberra, which has been commissioned from Michael Turner of the Guild of Aviation Artists. I'd like to unveil this painting and invite the station commander to find a suitable home for it in the officer's mess here at Witten, the home of the camera. The sword, not as plowshare, but as cake slice. From the public, the Canberra will never receive the affection of the Spitfire, Hurricane or Lancaster. But it is worth remembering that if there were any of the original Spitfires still in service, they'd only be 53, not youngish chaps of 40. Canberra is like its own service in a way. Decency, fortitude, straightforwardness, conservatism, common sense, good humour are words that come to mind. That's to say nothing of an eye for a good social occasion or a bit of ceremony.